This chapter explains how the banking system creates money and increases the money supply. In part one, the balance sheets of the banks are used to show how different transactions impact the banks and the money supply. In part two, you'll learn the difference between excess and required reserves, and you'll learn how the money multiplier impacts the money supply. The development of a functioning banking system is key to the economic development of any system. Banking developed as early traders recognized that carrying gold around to use in transactions was both unsafe and inconvenient. Goldsmiths would take the gold, store it in a safe place, and give the trader a receipt which could then be used in place of the gold. The trader could give the receipt to another party who could then go to the goldsmith and retrieve the gold. As the system developed, the goldsmiths were discovered that owners rarely actually came back for the gold. So some goldsmiths began issuing excess paper receipts as loans to merchants, producers, and really just about anyone whom they felt would pay back the loan. This was the beginning of what we now call the fractional reserve system. The only way that this system can fail is if every depositor demands their funds back at the same time, causing a run on the bank. Today's banking system has many safeguards in place to secure deposits and prevent panics from occurring. Here we move into what is almost a basic bookkeeping exercise, explaining how businesses use accounts to track information and compute balances, all the while maintaining an equality in their balance sheet accounts. Investors have created a bank and they organize it as a corporation by contributing a total of $250,000 cash to the bank in exchange for ownership shares in the bank's worth of $250,000. So the cash that they invest goes on to the asset side of our T account, whereas the stock shares go on the liabilities and net worth side of our T account. Notice that the two sides are equal. This will continue throughout the exercise. The next step is the business needs to acquire a building and some equipment for cash. This did not affect the total net worth of the bank, but was rather an exchange of one asset for another asset. So this occurs on one side. Notice assets still has $250,000 and liabilities and net worth also has $250,000. Then the bank has actually increased its value by accepting deposits from customers. The deposits are recorded as liabilities of the bank as the bank must return the money to customers whenever they request it. But the assets of the bank also increase as the bank now has more cash. Checkable deposits, which is the money that customers bring into the bank, go on the liabilities and net worth side. In this instance, $100,000. On the asset side, we have 100,000 added to our cash assets. Originally we had $10,000. Notice the two sides still equal. They both now have $350,000. Banks are not required to keep 100% of their deposits on hand at all times because the probability that all customers will ask for their money back at the same time is small. If all customers did return to demand their money at the same time, this would be referred to as a run on the bank. To prevent bank runs, the Federal Reserve sets required reserve ratios on all checkable deposits. What this means is essentially a percentage that the Federal Reserve requires the banks to keep on hand. For example, in our last slide we had $100,000 in checkable deposits. If the Federal Reserve requires 10% of those $100,000 in checkable deposits to be kept on hand, then the bank will actually deposit $10,000 into their Federal Reserve account. The other $90,000 they're now free to loan out, whether it's to businesses or individuals. If their reserves ever fall below that required reserve ratio, they're required to call in on some debts and to build that ratio back. In addition to reserves, commercial bank deposits are also protected through other means such as insurance. The FDIC, or Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, is an independent agency created by the U.S. government to eliminate the average citizen's fear of a bank run. Currently, the FDIC will insure deposits in banks for at least $250,000. In other words, if your bank unexpectedly hits hard times and closes, the FDIC will make sure you get your money back as long as you're below that $250,000 threshold. 
In our T account, the bank has decided to transfer all of its cash to the Federal Reserve Bank. The Federal Reserve serves as the banker's bank. So in this instance, the Wahoo Bank has decided instead of keeping the $110,000 on hand, that they'll deposit it into their account with the Federal Reserve. Notice there's no change on the liabilities and net worth side, but instead the cash has just been transferred into the reserve account. In our example, the excess reserves would equal $90,000, which is actual reserves of $110,000 minus the required reserve ratio of $20,000. This is because the Federal Reserve has decided that all banks must keep 20% of their checkable deposits on hand. In our instance, our checkable deposits were $100,000. In transaction number five, we see that when a customer writes a check against his or her balance, it reduces the reserves and the checkable deposits by the amount of the check. So in this example, the customer has written a $50,000 check, so $50,000 will be removed from the checkable deposits on the liabilities and net worth side of the T account, and $50,000 is removed from the asset side of the T account. Specifically, it's removed from the reserves. So now, in checkable deposits, the bank has $50,000, and in reserve, they have $60,000. Remember, though, they have to keep 20% of this $50,000 in their reserve account at all times. In transaction number 6A, we're going to begin actually creating new money, as opposed to just moving around old money. In this example, our bank has decided to grant a loan of $50,000. The bank's loans are actually its assets. Having someone owe you money is a good thing. Having them actually pay you back is even better. So here, both the assets and the deposits are increased. We're going to assume for this example that the person that takes out the loan with the bank is going to take that money and also put it into the check checkable deposits with the bank. So in this example, loans of $50,000 are added to the assets side. So we give that person $50,000 in loans. They take that $50,000 and deposit it into their checking account with the Wahoo Bank. So the checkable deposits of the Wahoo Bank have actually increased from $50,000 to $100,000. In transaction number 6B, the customer with the loan is then, of course, going to spend the money. That was the purpose of them taking out the loan. So they come in, write a check. That comes out of our bank, so the $50,000 goes back out of the checkable deposits and goes into another bank. The other bank's reserves would have increased while our bank decreases by the amount of the check. So checkable deposits decreases by $50,000, which also decreases our reserves by $10,000. Because remember, the loan is still owed to the bank, so that line item remains untouched. Instead, the $50,000 is coming out of reserves. Now we need to keep in mind that our required reserve ratio is 20%. So they still have to keep 20% of $50,000 on hand in their reserves.